Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Justin. I am an alcoholic. <laughs> so uh, a friend of mine, Larry, uh, reached out to me. You know, it's a funny story with me and Larry about... Uh, Ten years back, we kind of work in the time, same type of industry for work, and uh, a little bit about kind of how I ran back when I was drinking is, um, I remember I walked into the job that he was working at, and I, I demanded my last paycheck because I told him I had a mini stroke because um, I was detoxing so hard off the alcohol and I'd run out of money, and uh, that's kind of how I, uh, that's how I ran, you know. Um, this disease wanted nothing more than my life in the end. Um, I grew up in uh, Santee, California. If anybody knows where that's at. <laughs> I spent some uh, time living uh, in New York, upstate Syracuse, and um, and you'll you'll kind of hear through my journey uh, different things that I had tried to do, uh, change of environment, etc., uh, to try to overcome this disease of alcoholism. So um, you know, to set out, uh, I probably didn't really start to uh, even have my first uh, drink until I was uh, I was in Catholic school in upstate New York. I was probably about twelve years old, and uh, I had a beer with one of the uh, one of the local kids. And I remember I took like two sips of it and I threw it in the woods and I'm like, God, that tastes like shit. You know what I mean? Mm-mm-mm. Don't want any of that. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, um, I had behavior issues, you know, so they thought that the best thing for a guy like me was probably to put me in a school where uh, somebody could watch over me. And that's, uh, that's what Catholic school was meant to do for me. And it didn't work out too well. So I eventually returned back home to San Diego with my uh, mother and my, my sisters and um, 13, 14 years old, um, I'm drinking alcohol with all the neighborhood people. You know, it was, it was kind of a, a thing we did. I usually ran. I used to have friends who had older brothers, so uh, the ability to get access to alcohol was probably pretty easy. Um, I did a lot, some outside issues, smoked a lot of weed. You know, I was like a skater kid. And um, what eventually starts to happen to me is uh, in my high school years, after uh, getting high a lot, um, I got caught in a situation where a party broke out and I was high on uh, psychedelics and a friend of mine pulled a knife and uh, things got crazy real fast and they tell me that I was diagnosed with a mild dose of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of it. Um, so any time that I would turn to a, a substance like weed, I would uh, I'd go into complete panic attacks, anxiety, the world's crashing around me. So my primary focus came um, not to get sober and put everything down, but was to uh, focus my attention on drinking and alcohol. And um, in my high school years, as long as I stayed going to school and I played football, et cetera, um, at this time I drinking, I'm not drinking during the week, I'm drinking on the weekends. Uh, quite a few trips down to Revolution in Tijuana. Uh, you know, I had an older sister and, you know, um, and even then it didn't propose a problem for me. And uh, I'm about 19, 20 years old, and uh, it's time to start growing up. And uh, at this point, I'm already a daily drinker. You know, I, uh, I get off of work, get myself a 12-pack of Bud Light with my fake ID. Obviously, I'm not 21 yet. I'm hanging out in PB. I used to laugh, you know, when people tell me, you know, oh, I'm 21, and I'm going to go party. And, man, I'd already kind of, like, destroyed the entire circuit, you know, by the time I was 21. <laughs> you know, there were, there were signs I had a drinking problem. And um, so I was failing to grow. It was time to grow up, and I, and I was failing to grow. And, uh, you know, I don't know where the threshold was crossed for me. Um, the big book Alcoholics Anonymous will describe that, that uh, in the life of every real alcoholic, that there'll be a point of no return. And, um, you know, I don't know, what does it happen on a Saturday morning? Is it that Saturday morning when you you'll probably go get a breakfast burrito and sleep off the hangover that you find yourself in the in the fridge grabbing a beer? You know what I mean? Is it uh, you waking up on a Sunday and justifying being at the bar at 7 a.m. and getting hammered because football's on? You know, I don't know. These are not normal things for normal people, you know. And until I could start to identify that those were things that were starting to happen in my life, um, I didn't want to stop. You know, the consequences, the price to be paid weren't high enough yet. And so, um, you know, I'm 24 years old, and, uh, and my mother passes. And, uh, and I couldn't, uh, 
I couldn't hang. I couldn't cope. I, I did the one thing I'd always known how to do, which was to throw myself that much harder into the bottle. And now the problem is at this point is, is that when I start to drink, I cannot stop. My binges last probably about two or three days straight at this point. You know, I go down to the local store and I get myself a tall can and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not eating by day number two and by day number three, I'm starting to shake so violently and my, and I'm sweating and I'm just out of it, you know, and, and I'm still not ready to get help yet. <clears throat> and I think that it's all these other things in my life that are causing my drinking problem. And, uh, you know, my sister, she had, uh, she was concerned for me. And she said, you know, maybe, maybe being in San Diego and, and the death of mom is, uh, the reason why you drink the way you drink and, uh, get out of here, you know? And, uh, and I reached out to my father and, uh, we had not been very close with each other. And, uh, he said, come out to New York and, uh, I'll put you to work in Canada. And I'm like, Canada, here we go. You know what I mean? The trick about Canada is, is that they have beer stores and liquor stores, right? Literally, that's the name of them, a beer store and a liquor store, and it's governed by the providences. And uh, you can't just go to the local 7-Eleven or the market to get booze. And so um, I'm thinking that might, this might be a good idea, you know, but uh, I have this thing. I have an obsession, right? And an obsession is something where the thought is so powerful that all sound logic goes right out of my mind, you know? The most insane thing I do when I'm sober is I take a drink. I'm an alcoholic, right? That's pretty crazy. And, and given the repercussions and the recourses that happened to me as a result of taking that drink, nothing is strong enough, no thought, no pain, no fear, to combat that thought and that obsession to want to go out and play the game again. And so when I was up in Canada, I would feel this obsession. It was terrible. You know, I almost felt like uh, somebody who chases crack cocaine, but I wanted alcohol that bad that I was willing to go to any lengths to try to get it, you know? And my father starts to see this in me, and he's like, you got a problem, and I can't help you. And so uh, I remember we returned back down from uh, New York after some, uh, you know, some drinking episodes. And uh, his wife had uh, handed me a ticket. She said, go back to San Diego or uh, check yourself into rehab. And uh, I was like, well, I'm not checking into fucking rehab. You know what I mean? <laughs> so going, so going back to San Diego, you know, you know, there's all these opportunities to, to help myself and I can't, you know, like my pride and my ego is too big to think that alcohol is the problem. And, um, so, um, eventually my, my, my family comes out to visit and, uh, they're like, you know, come back home with us. And, uh, and I moved in with my sister in Los Angeles and, uh, and she tried to be a loving sister and love her brother, you know? And it's just, uh, like the book talks about, I'm a tornado, right? I rip through the lives of those around me. I just cause, it caused destruction and chaos. And, uh, cause there's only one thing that I love more than life, and that was the bottle. And there's a price to be paid. And, uh, eventually she, she did something that, that was very good for her to do. Get out of my house. Go figure your life out, you know? And, uh, and I did, and I moved into this house and, and it turned into a party house, you know, and boy, did we drink, you know? And, uh, and I remember there were like, uh, she, she comes up to the driveway one day and I'm sitting in the garage, I'm drunk. And, and, and she goes, Hey, you know, uh, she's upset one more time. So she's upset. She's concerned for brother. And, uh, she goes the employer called, you know, your emergency contact. I guess you haven't been at work for three days. And I'm like, damn, you know what I mean? Like, holy shit, you know what I mean? Like when I, <laughs> when I get on, man, I'm telling you, it's just like I'm ripping and roaring my, through my life. And um, see, I start to think that the circumstances of my life are what drive me to drink. I think that it's because of my job and what I do, or I don't make enough money, or I don't have what you have, or it's this, or it's who ad infinitum, right? Really, I was just an alcoholic, and I didn't know it. I tried to go to a couple of AA meetings in L.A., and uh, they handed me a big book, and I went home, and I threw that in the closet. And uh, I think I read How It Works. I was like, I don't even know what this is about, but 
this isn't it. So <laughs> I, I moved back to San Diego, and uh, the same sister that suggested I probably move to New York is the same sister who let me back in. And, you know, everybody was always hoping against hope for Justin that he was going to get sober. This was the time, you know what I mean? Like, as the rest of us, you know, the rest of my sisters, they were okay. But brother can't get it. He's not, he's just drinking himself to death. And uh, you would hope at 28 years old that I'd finally wake up and change my ways. And, uh, and no, you know? And so um, at this point, when I get on, I start drinking on a Friday night. I probably don't come to until Wednesday of the next week. You know, so... It's tough, you know, because by Sunday you're not eating, and then Monday, Tuesday, you're slipping in and out of consciousness. And then um, I'd rent motel rooms, you know, because I couldn't be around my family. I'm driving around in a car that's hot-wired with expired tags with warrants out for my rest, you know, uh, trying to find a good place, a good cul-de-sac to crash out in where they're not going to call the cops on me as I drink in the back seat of my car. You know, it's, uh, it's horrible. And that, that was just my life. And, um, you know, I don't know, you know, I was, I was four months with no alcohol in my system before I went on the last run to end all runs. Uh, Bill W talks about that in his story. And he says, you know, it was the bender to end all benders. And I thought that, uh, I have a date of sobriety and that is May 10th of 2010. And so, um, I told myself in the uh, January of 2010 with a good friend of mine, got a job working for this IT firm up in Sorrento Valley. He says, check it out. I love you. You're my brother. I'm going to get sober with you. We're going to get sober together. Problem is he's not an alcoholic, right? <laughs> he doesn't understand that what I'm going through about how bad the obsession is hitting me, about how my mind is spinning out of control and that, that I, there's no peace to be had. And, um, and I drink, you know, it's, uh, staying out with a girl one night and, uh, it's playing rock band Beatles edition. That's a great rock band. You know what I mean? It's funny with that about, about like the, the thinking, you know, before the drink. And, and it usually kind of comes like in a way of saying, what could be better than this? Well, a drink would be better than this. How about this and drinking? And then I'm gone. You know what I mean? Like on another one, like I can't recall how bad it's going to get. Like I'm going to destroy my life one more time. And, uh, and that's what I did. And, uh, you know, I, um, I remember it was like a Monday and I was supposed to be at work and I decided to take whatever little money I had. And I, I rented out a motel room over in El Cajon over there off of, uh, old highway eight. This is a very sordid spot. <laughs> the rooms smell. They still have box TVs. It's rough. But but I but I was done. It, it wasn't another run. It was uh, this time. I bought as much booze as I possibly could buy with an attempt to take my life by bottle. I was pulling a leaving Vegas. You know, I was going to do it because I could not imagine going back to that life, back to drinking. Uh, uh-uh. fuck that. I'm not, I'm not going to do it again. And um. And over the course of a couple of days of just this constant, insane binge drinking, the throwing up, the pissing blood, the, the whole nine, I, uh, I hit a point where I, uh, I cried out, you know, I cried out to my mom. I didn't know God. I don't know anything about God, but I knew my mom was in heaven. And I said, you know, God, if I, if I die tonight, that, um, just, just don't make it hurt, you know? And, uh, and then next morning when I came to, I was on my knees and I, you know, I prayed to my mom. I said, you know, if you could help me. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> and God answered, you know, in his own way, like he always does in Alcoholics Anonymous. And so, um, <clears throat> I went back to my sister's house. She moved out on me. She literally packed her shit up and moved to another apartment. <laughs> yeah. She said, I don't know what you're going to do with your life, but I'm no longer a part of it. <laughs> and looking back now, it was the best thing she could have absolutely have done. Get as far away from me as possible. Went on Craigslist. I, uh, 
I found myself living in Lakeside, California. And uh, I, I, I only had just a little bit of money. I, I had this flat screen TV I bought at Best Buy. I was very proud of it. I thought that was my last sliver of hope in life, that if I could hold on to the flat screen TV, everything was going to be okay. <laughs> and so I had to go to Best Buy in Santee and return it and uh, pay my sister uh, for the back rent that I just missed. And I had a little bit of money left over, and I went to my other sister, and I said, uh, you know, I need to borrow 100 bucks. I need to check myself into the sober living. And even then, she was like, well, I want a receipt. I want proof. I don't trust you. And, uh, and that's what I did. And, uh, you know, I, a good, a good friend of mine, the man who read uh, more about alcoholism, Lyle, he, uh, he was my roommate, you know, eight years ago in that sober living, you know, it's kind of a trip, you know, all these years later, still running together. And, um, so I had to learn to grow up and, uh, I probably stuck around, I was around AA 45 days, about that time. Nobody gave me a 30-day token. I, I bought it on my own at the El Conolano Club. Um, I used to just sit in the back of the rooms just in tears, crying, because I, I just, I'm hopeless. I don't know what to do with myself. And uh, they kept on talking about the book and the steps, and I'm like, I don't even know what this is. What is this? Am I even an alcoholic? Like, what, what, you know? And, uh, you know, my roommate, Lyle, he, uh, he handed me a phone to a man who, uh, he was some old timer, some big book thumper, you know, good coming up in East County. I'll tell you what, you stick around there. You can run with the right circle of people and they will big book thump you, you know, and that's how it went down. And so, uh, about 45 uh, days into it, I start calling this man and he's asking me all these questions about my religious leanings, my background. Did I think I was done? You know, and, and what he was doing is he was qualifying the alcoholic. Am I really a real alcoholic? Do I really want help? Cause I'm not going to waste my time. And, uh, so I, I asked him, um, over the phone, I said, Hey, you sponsor me. And he said, I don't do that. Uh, I'll do that over the phone. I said, okay. I'll meet you over at the rec center in Lakeside for meeting time. Okay. So I, uh, I went to him and I asked him. I said, okay, here we are. I'm going to do it. We're going to do this. And I said, you sponsor me. He says, no. <laughs> I says, but I'll work with you. So I'll take you to the book. I said, okay. And he says, what I'm going to need to do is you're going to grab a notebook. You can grab some pencils. You can grab a dictionary. And uh, we're going to walk through this process a page a day, three cents at a time, and you're going to look up some words you don't know. That's what we're going to do. The next thing he does is, uh, God, he, God, he was homeless looking. Damn, you know what I mean? <laughs> I, he asked me, he said, you know, what, what did you want from me? And I said, to be honest with you, I wanted your walk, dude. He had this sense of ease about him. He just kind of cruised, you know, just living life. I'm just like like a commercial or something. <laughs> That's that, that was what was appealing, you know? <clears throat> and uh, he put his arm around me, and he pointed me over to the uh, local liquor store in the bar, and he looked me in the eye, and he says, hey, um, if this ever gets too difficult, right, go drink. And I'm like, what? Like, you can't tell me that. Like, you're not the person that's supposed to tell me that, you know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, my whole life, everybody had always told me, don't drink. Don't do it. No, Matt, don't do it. But the man who's supposed to help me is the one telling me to go drink, you know? And I'm like, I don't want to drink. You don't understand. Didn't I just tell you my story? And he says, hey, don't worry about it. Look, if it gets, if it gets too hard, go. Because you're going anyways. You know? And, uh, and I got in that book. And, you know, and I, and I learned back in, you know, 1939 that they launched a chip of a book on the worldwide tide of alcoholism. Right? I learned that there were a hundred in the beginning who drafted up in an anonymous volume. And, um... You know, going through the steps, um, first step in recovery being that I conceded to my innermost self that I was truly an alcoholic, right? More about alcoholism, first page. And what it, what that means to concede, it means to say that something is false and then come to believe that it's true. See, my whole life, I, I had not conceded to alcohol or alcoholism. I'd always said that it was false, that it wasn't real, that I it wasn't that bad. And then all of a sudden, when I read that book and I read those pages... Yeah, based on what they were telling me, based on my own experience and my own background, it was true. So I finally conceded. <clears throat> the the God thing in the program was uh, 
I was sitting on the staircase outside of sober living out there in Lakeside, California. And, um, I called the man who was walking me through the process and I said, uh, Hey, I don't know, man. I don't know if this is, uh, it's going to work out for me. I don't, I don't know about this whole God thing. Like I'm not a religious guy and I'm not spiritual or nothing. You know, my, my mom, she was Catholic. She used to have this crucifix that used to hang up next to her, next to the front door, but we never went to church. And I have a father who's a practicing Buddhist and he loves to do him some yoga, but I don't know anything about that either, you know? <laughs> and so, uh, you know, he, uh, he started to laugh real hard, you know? And then he hung the phone up on me. <laughs> he hung up the phone on me a lot. I don't know what the hell was hanging up on the phone, but I'll tell you why he, used, he, would, he would do these things. And I called him back. I said, hey, you know, line lost. He said, no, hung up on him. And then, he, and then he said some words, and he says, you still, keep in mind, I'm about 90 days. He said, you still think it's you keeping you sober. Wake up. Click. <laughs> Damn, you know what I mean? Here we are. You know what I mean? I guess maybe because he thought I wouldn't get it or something, that he had to do those things to me. <laughs> there would be other moments that where, where, where these old timers would, it, they became a great asset to my life is that they were helping to condition me into a man and to be an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous even back then. And it was always pounded into my head that the boys were with the boys and the girls are with the girls in this program. You're not to help and reach your hand out to a woman or a girl in the program. There are plenty of men to help, right? And I remember I would, uh, it, at the time of getting sober, I'm starting to date a little bit. And, um, and I'd be like, hey, I'm going to go hang out with this girl or I'm going to go hang out with this chick. And he'd hang the phone up on me. And I call him back and I go, and I, and I really thought we lost connection at this point, you know? Like I was like, we lost connection. This wasn't a hang up. And he said, what's her name? And I, I say, you know, whatever. I say, Susie. Susie's her name. Where does she live? What does she do for a living? What does she like to do, Justin? I go, yeah. He's like, because she's a person, because she's a human being. She ain't a chick. She ain't a girl, right? And then he hang up the phone on me. <laughs> so, so any time that I would start to talk to him as I was going through my sobriety, and I would talk about the like, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go hang out. It's Friday night. I'm gonna go hang out with. And if I didn't say her name, the phone would just hang up. <laughs> so I, I was broken into it. I learned, you know what I mean? There's a lot of learning to do, you know, growing up here in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, living in sober living, I had to learn how to make my own bed. I had to learn how to, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, make my own food. What's that about? You know what I mean? <laughs> like, go to the grocery store, you know what I mean? Walking through there, just trying to figure out what's what, and like pots and pans, and what to use, and, and I didn't really do any of that stuff, you know? And, um... So, you know, in, in, in step three, I, uh, I don't know. Yeah. I just stayed open-minded to it. You know, I, I took an inventory the way the book told me to write it. Um, the last page of there is a solution. It says further on clear cuts directions are given on precisely how we've recovered from a seemingly hopeless condition of mind and body. The big book is all you need to walk this process. And, uh, that's exactly what I did. And that's how exactly how I do it with guys that I work with. And, um, you know, looking over the inventory, I didn't even have any idea what I was doing. I was like, what is this? You know what I mean? Like the self-searching, leveling of pride, confession of shortcomings. You know, I did it because I had the desperation of a drowning man. And uh, when I went out to go sit in this hillside to talk about my life story, about all the, the wrongs that I had caused and uh, how angry I was at all these people, institutions and principles, um, there was a sense of relief that I got from it, you know. What I will tell you, the most important thing that happens in a fifth step is uh, the 10% that you keep in your back pocket. Most of the time when I work with guys or my own experience has been the most important things usually don't make it to paper. A couple of those things probably would have locked me up in prison, but they were discussed. And um, we don't dodge our creditors, right? There was another big boy moment of my life, you know? Pulling my credit report, looking at those repossessed cars. My sisters would call me. They would get all upset, you know. They could be like, there's an investigator looking for you, you know, because one more time, it's the repo guy. You know what I mean? Because I'm a guy that goes to a dealership. I make three car payments, and I let it slide for about nine months until they find me. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's, you know, when you, when, you, when you drink the way I drank, you didn't, you didn't uh, you know, you, you didn't do big boy stuff. 
And um, it wasn't easy, you know. It took two or three years to become debt-free, you know. Um, but I just run with that kind of crowd, you know what I mean? Like, how how willing are you to overcome this alcoholism, you know? So it's in question. So I had to go and make amends, you know, the, some of my worst enemies that I thought as soon as I got out of the car and I walked up to the front door, we were going to be fist fighting on the front lawn, turned into uh, handshakes, hugs, and cries. Those bridges were re-mended, re, uh, and uh, we were able to have that friendship we once had even as, as children, you know, and, and what a feeling, what, what a, you know, um, it really works, you know, I, uh, the continuation of taking the inventory, um, in the process is, is a continual thing that I do on a daily basis. Uh, the prayer and the meditation, um, it's continual. It's a part of my life. Um, the 12 step work that I do, I continue to work with other alcoholics. Um, probably, I probably do three or four, make it through a year. You know what I mean? But who, who knows what the high end number is? You know what I mean? There's a lot of attempts out there. Some guys are just not ready. You know, I, AA really works. Any guy that I've ever taken through the process who has walked through the process has gotten a byproduct. But better than that, um, they're still sober today. You know? So it does work. Um, but just going through the phases of development as a result of working these principles in my life, I uh, probably about a year after being sober and walking the process, I'd already kind of done an inventory, I'd done a fifth step, paid restitution. I was well able to look at myself in the mirror. Um, I was what I was, and I was my truth. Um, I started doing work. Uh, I got an opportunity to take a job working for a government arm. Um, looking at my past, I was instantly uh, investigated for clearance. That was fun. Um, I was assigned an agent of the OPM, Office of Personnel Management. I thought I did a fifth step, but uh, I tell you what, get uh, get assigned to an agent from OPM, and uh, they'll do the fifth step for you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I remember sitting in this room, and I had to put up my hand and swear an oath of allegiance to the United States government and all this other stuff. And uh, <clears throat> she said, you don't have to be here. You can leave. You know, you don't uh, you don't have to do this. And I'm like, you know what? I believe God brought me to this, so he'll, he'll see me through it, whether I get the job or not or I get to keep it. Um, really is in God's hands. And, uh, you know, for whatever reason, uh, I got assigned an agent who went to bat for me, um, over in Washington with a security specialist. And, uh, cause I had wreckage, man. I mean, four or five jobs a year. I remember I, I, I didn't pay my taxes for five years when I got sober and I didn't know how to backtrack who I worked for. You know what I mean? I was like, where did I work at? Cause <laughs> my, life, my life was just a mess. And, and I had to go to a, uh, a tax attorney who had to go to the IRS to ask them what jobs I worked. You know, that's, you know, whatever. You know what I mean? Like cleaning up that wreckage is, is tricky at times. But, um, you know, because I did a fist step, I was able to, on every situation, every place I lived and who I lived with and my decisions and and I was able to give them an honest answer. I was able to use the tools of this program to show them my shortcomings and my defects of character and that I, that I was working on it. You know what I mean? They're like, well, let's, let's pull your credit report. Okay. Did you take care of those tickets at the court? Okay. Those got taken care of. All right. Let's get your, okay. There's some attempts made there. Any of that stuff had not been started to get worked on that first year of sobriety. I'm gone. I'm done. You know what I mean? I've been with that company, uh, seven years now. You know, and uh, it's just been continual growth. I don't have to tell you. You know what I mean? Like it really works. Um, lived in the sober living for about a year. Moved out, got an apartment. Another big, big boy moment for me. Um, I had a little twenty-five dollar TV off of Craigslist. I had this little couch that my buddy donated to me, and I had a little mattress in my bedroom. But it was my apartment. And better than that, was I going to drink? Now I live alone. Now I'm not in sober living. Well, they said, keep your nose in the book. Go to meetings. Work with other alcoholics. I didn't drink. Rented a, a condo out in Lakeside. Next move after that. And, uh, and I met the woman who would become my wife. You know, um, it's amazing. 
know, they talk about that in the big book. Uh, we get to choose our ideal, our truth, right? Who our partner's going to be in life. You know, and as long as you stick to that ideal, then God will make it happen. And uh, I believed after a couple years of trying to figure out what that idea was, i just kind of given up, and I'd had this clear-cut idea of what I wanted. And then uh, and when God deemed it ready, she, he put her in my life, you know? Um, probably within a couple years of her getting done with grad school and getting her master's, um, we got married. And, uh, and that was a little different, you know, because I'm more of a spiritual-based life, not a religious guy. You know, and then she has Catholic leanings. And so I had to get married in the Catholic church. You know what I mean? So I'm like, I'm not becoming Catholic. I'm just going to let you get everybody know that that's not what I'm going to do. So, you know, but, but it's important that I respect the fact that other people have different religious backgrounds and beliefs and they have their own relationship to God. It was another thing I learned in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, um, there are a lot of people who venture into these rooms and they come from very, a lot of different sect denominations and backgrounds. And what I'm supposed to do here is I'm supposed to respect that, I'm supposed to honor that and love that. And I was able to take that into my own situation with getting married in the church. You know, um, it wasn't easy. Um, my baby's due in December. I'm be a daddy. And uh, I don't know what to tell you people. What the, like, 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 what do you, what do you want to hear? Like, does AA work? I don't know what to tell you. You know what I mean? Like, it has only gotten better. You know what I mean? Since the day I've gotten here, it has just gotten exponentially better. I remember that I, I took my, my one year token and, and this man who gave it to me, who took me through the process, he looks at me and he says, how was that first year? I said, rocking in the fourth dimension of existence. It's the best ever, you know, like, yeah, you know what I mean? Got the new job. I passed my clearance. I'm making money. I'm living on my own. I bought a brand new car. Like I bought a brand new car and I paid it off in a year. In fear, in in fear that I would not be able to afford a car payment, that my shit was going to get repoed like the two other vehicles they get. That's how powerful God is. You know what I mean? I put limitations on God, and God just blows it out of the water. That's what my life is like. And he said to me, he said, uh, he's like, if you think your first year is good, wait till year number two. Got better. And every year, it just gets better. And sometimes in not like a material progressive way, but sometimes just in an emotional growing up stage. And I guess like this year would probably be the year of uh, the baby and learning to become a father and what that looks like and to practice these principles in my life. Um, you know, I, uh, it's the men. I've been very fortunate. To be honest with you, it was the men who God put in my life that have taught me a lot about life. Old timers in my neighborhood. It's old timer. Um, good friend of mine. He, uh, he called me up. We go over. He, he had this thing about building up hot rods and beating Lambos and then blowing the engine afterwards. He just kind of like, it was thing he got off and I don't know what his deal was, whatever. And so <laughs> he would, uh, he would, he would take these huge 454 motors and drop them in these Vegas. And uh, go out to the racetrack at Qualcomm, and he would try to find the newest Lamborghini so that he could beat him and tell him that he just dropped five grand in that car and he just smoked him. And I'm like, God, dude, what? You know what I mean? You're like 25 years of sobriety, dude. Like, what's going on around here, you know? <laughs> you know, that's what I'm saying. Like, I always run, like, with real people in the program. You know, like, if you're a spiritual guru, we're probably not going to hang out. Like, I just run with a rough crowd. <laughs> so, um... What I will tell you is what I, what I learned from him is I learned about, I learned a lot about God and he had his own way of speaking about it. Uh, and the reason why I bring him up in this speak is that, uh, you know, he, uh, he passed away probably about eight months ago and he was like a father to me. And he, um, when he was, uh, you know, he, he told me at 10 years of sobriety, he said, um, I was in my driveway here working on one of the cars and, uh, when my son comes home, I was 22 years old at the time. And he had stage four te testicular cancer. And he's like, how am I ever going to stay sober? Because I had to bury my son in two months. And um, it's powerful. You know what I mean? So, like, there's no excuse to drink. There's none. You know? There's just none. And um, 
But on the flip side of that is if you don't live life on a spiritual basis, you become spiritually bankrupt and the thought of drink will return and in, invariably you will get drunk again. And, um, I don't know, you know, I, I haven't, uh, I've never hit that point in eight plus years. I've always maintained it. I've always stayed involved in it. Um, I don't know. I just, I have always kept a love and a passion. It was something that was given to me from the very beginning. And, uh, I like to share that with guys I work with. And if you watch them, you see the byproduct, that fight they have for Alcoholics Anonymous is in them. And they're very ground and pound about it. And a lot of guys they work would do very well too, you know? And I think that, uh, you know, there's a difference between book AA and mainstream AA. And, um, you know, there's a little side story to that. And, um, I'll kind of just share this little side story. And the way it was told to me was, uh, in the beginning of Alcoholics Anonymous in Akron, Ohio, they had a 95% success rate with Dr. Bob and the groups of its time. Bill had left Akron, Ohio, uh, to build out Alcoholics Anonymous in New York in the general offices. And, uh, Bill was more about being the president of Alcoholics Anonymous than being a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. When he would share that message with his groups and the people that he would work with, it became more about ego and pride than it can be, than it, than it was about God and helping others. Soon enough, uh, nobody's staying sober. Everybody's relapsing left and right. Nobody can get sober. And in a desperate attempt, he goes back to Dr. Bob in Akron, Ohio, and he asks him for help. He says, I don't know what's going on. I don't understand it. It's the same book. It's the same book. Why can't these guys get sober? Right? So Bob explains to him, he says, it's not about God for you anymore. It's about you. You're a sponsor and your sponsees and your it's like this ego feeding proposition for you. And he learns the errors, errors, errors of his ways. And he re- returns back to New York and he goes back to these groups that he started and he tells them, um, Hey, I'm sorry. I went down the wrong road. I have shortcomings, defects of character. He amends and basically the, uh, the people told him just to pound sand and screw you. And we're sober. And we're not going to do what you tell us or hear your message or anything. So there's always been a warring fraction of Alcoholics Anonymous that has always existed. And it is the line between a book AA and a mainstream AA. And that's very important. It still exists today. You know, um, get in the book. Do what it tells you to do. Do not rely on other human beings. Human beings are fallible. They will fail you, right? Trust in God. He's all powerful. It's right there in the book. It's magic. Do the work. It's magic. I swear. You're going to be like, oh my God, it's magic. And, uh, you know, welcome to the newcomers, you know? God's just stood up, man. I was in the same spot eight years ago, sitting right in this meeting. So cow, right in the back. I'm not in the middle, <laughs> crying back there somewhere. <laughs> Just find, trying to find somewhere to go on a Saturday night. But, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's this great prayer, and, uh, and I'll close with this. And uh, this is called the Prayer of Notre Dame. And, uh, and I always think about, like, the fighting Irish and going out onto the field and slapping the panel, you know, walking through the tunnel. And uh, the prayer goes, uh, I sought my God, my God I could not see. I sought my soul, my soul I could not free. I sought my brother, and I found all three. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.